our United Methodist calendar. This is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, ending uh, that season as we go into uh, Easter Tide. Uh, our services will focus on Minton this Wednesday, so we're inviting everyone to come out for Ash, what we call Ash Wednesday services, uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. The Transfiguration Sunday <coughs> is celebrated throughout our church. It is a beautiful scene there on the Mount, Transfiguration where we celebrate what God did in terms of just a glimpse of his glory. You've heard the lectionary reading this morning taken from Mark, the ninth chapter, verses through, through 9. And we want to focus in on the sixth verse of that chapter. And I've chosen the message translation of our Bible to highlight what I feel is going to help us determine a bit better what was going on on that mountain and how it applies to us today. I will reread verse 6 of chapter 9 of Mark, and it reads as this, He blurted this out without thinking, stunned as they all were by what they were seeing. And the subject we want to discuss for a few moments is taken from the Hebrew word salah or salah depending on which part of the country you're from. Uh, salah, or Saleh, can be found in the Psalms. It also can be found three times in Habakkuk, the third chapter. The meaning that we get from most scholars and historians and wordsmiths is not precise. It can mean to pause or some musical interlude. It can mean that special attention be placed upon a certain section of a song where those who are singing will either sing at a higher pitch or just remain silent. It also can be used as a term to signal that there will be a loud clashing of symbols as part of a song. Traditionalists, early traditionalists of the Hebrew meaning of the word, it meant forever. More contemporary definitions of the word can be seen as, as we use the word amen. In our amplified version of our Bibles, it defines it as taking a pause and calmly thinking about it. I like that, and I would use that as support of what Peter said unto Jesus as Jesus was transfigured there on the mountain with him. Peter did not take 
the traditional use of salah at heart on this occasion. For what he, James, and John saw was something that had never been seen before. And as our text from the message translation, I think, more closely describes what was going on in Peter's mind that caused him to say what he said was that he blurted it out without pausing and then calmly thinking about it. He blurted it out because they, meaning he, James, and John, many of our translations of the Bible said that they were terrified. You know, he said they were greatly afraid. They were frightened. They were greatly terrified. But of all the translations that we have, we know that there was something about what was going on that words could not explain. That what Peter, James, and John saw in terms of the transfiguration of Christ was something that was out of this world, that had never entered into the mind of mankind. And that being the glory, just a small glimpse of the glory of God. I don't believe that the powers that be in terms of filmmaking and all of the high tech that go into special effects could ever capture precisely or adequately enough of what Peter, James, and John saw there on the mountain. Just a glimpse of Christ unveiling and letting human eyes see his glory. You're reminded that six Days prior to this, Jesus had told them after Peter had had this revelation from God that he was the Christ, that some of them would not die until they see the glory of God's kingdom. And as they went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he, being Jesus, Peter, John and James went up to the mountain and stayed a bit. And on the day that God decided that these three men, Peter, James, and John, were to be privileged to see what God was going to show them in Jesus, that they came. And as they awoke, they saw something <coughs> that they'd never seen before. They did not see the sun shining on Jesus so brightly. They did not see an external agent descending upon Jesus and making him bright. They saw something brighter than the sun, something that Mark declares no bleaching agent could ever bleach it as white as this. They saw something radiating out of Jesus from the inside that transcended even the clothes that he had on. The clothes that he had on were no barrier unto that which was coming out of him. I don't care what century 
you have been born in perhaps the 21st century with all of this pyrotechnics and but imagine being there on that mountain without the use of a cell phone to capture maybe even a selfie I learned how to do a selfie <laughs> but that moment of seeing such a sight wow words could not express adequately express the reality of that moment the instant of that moment the God in that moment but Peter but Peter and many of the translations said he interrupted and said, Rabbi or teacher, it is good that we are here. Let us build three tabernacles or memorials to you, to Elijah, and to Moses. He blurted it out, and that seemed like, on a casual glance, the thing to say. Peter, impulsive Peter, Peter the leader, Peter, who is so just like us, when we open mouth and insert foot, Peter had to say something. He was compelled to say something. Wouldn't we, after seeing such a sight, a glorious sight, wouldn't we have something to say? Wouldn't we want to say something that kind of fit the occasion, huh? I, I would probably be tempted myself to say what Peter said. Well, this is this 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 is wow. We got to have this Kodak moment, and we've got to capture it, and we've got to put some tabernacles or some memorials here that signified that I was here. That we were here, and that God was here, and this marks the spot. I, I would be tempted to do that. But the record has it that he did not know what to say. He blurted it out. Whatever he blurted it out in these words, without thinking, without salah, without pausing and taking it in and reasoning as to what was actually going on. Too many times we are quick to pull the trigger on trying to explain or trying to respond to a phenomenon such as this and we come up all too short of the gravity of it all, of the meaning of it all, of the depthness of it all, that Jesus is God, and that he was displaying just a glimpse of his glory. Peter, like us, wanted to reduce God to a status that is more tangible to our senses, such as a personality of Elijah or Moses. How Peter, John, and James knew that the men that were talking to Jesus as he was being transfigured is unknown to us. Perhaps it was the revealed knowledge that these two men who were talking to Jesus as he was being transfigured, as he was showing the glory of which we all want, and eventually we'll see those who are in the Lord, there was some type of reference there, some type of marker in the mind there that these two individuals were Moses and Elijah. How they knew that I don't know, but there is 
a lesson here that in God's glory is his saints. In God's glory, there is relationship. In God's glory, we all will have a relationship with him where there is communication between us and God. <coughs> Moses and Elijah were talking in deep conversation. One of the translations has it with Jesus. Hmm? That in his glory, that we, his children, will be in deep relationship with him. It gives us a glimpse that in the sweet by and by, we will be with God and his glory. That those who have passed before us will be a part of that great cloud of witnesses around God's throne. And we, like them, will one day be a part of that great crowd of witnesses as a part of God's glory. Peter, John, and James saw this and they were so afraid. They were frightened. They were filled with fear. There was something about that scene that resonated with them. They had not seen such a scene like this before, and yet they were there in the presence of this Jesus whom they had walked with and talked with and felt with and had relationship with on a human level. But now he was revealing something of himself that was out of this world. And Peter starts talking. Outside of Salah, outside of even falling prostrate on the ground and not saying a word, having some input to what was going on <coughs> reminds me of how we might have as a prior life. Hmm. that when we are in the presence of God or when we go to God in prayer, we want our input. We want to say what we have to say. We want to blurt out immediately what's on our hearts and mind. But in this scene here, there was a cloud that came over. The Shekinah glory came over. And God called out from that cloud and said, This is my son, my beloved son. Listen to him. Amen. If I could just paraphrase it, I'd say, Peter, be quiet. Because you don't know really what you're talking about. You're putting God on the level of Moses and Elijah. Whatever you want to do in terms of worship, you ought to worship God and God alone. So don't put a tabernacle for Elijah. Don't put a tabernacle for Moses. If you're going to do worship, Worship God alone. Therefore, Peter, JB, be quiet. Shut up. And listen to what God has to say. Too many times I go to God in prayer. Hmm. Perhaps you may go to God in prayer and you want to blurt out what's on your heart and what's on your mind. But here is saying, why don't you just be quiet and listen to what God has to say? That's right. Why don't you survive? Why don't you just survive and just pause and hear what God has to say? I think our prayer lives would be so much better. I think if we survive, we would hear what God wants us to hear. 
that our thoughts and that our wants and that our desires would not drown out what God is speaking to us. Even though it may be a good thing, even though we may have seen something so beautifully, even though it may be spectacular, sometimes it's just best to be quiet and just take it in and listen to God as he speaks to us through his miracles, as he speaks to us through the glories of his creation. Look at a tree and listen to God. Hmm. Look at a bird soaring through the sky and just listen to God. See a waterfall and the pureness of that water falling and just listen to God. See a newborn baby and just listen to God. Hmm? Take a walk amongst the cemetery and see the headstones and how beautifully the graves are in alignment there at the National Cemetery and listen to God. See a butterfly go from flower to flower Get in that turn and listen to God. Amen. See a fellow man, a fellow woman in prison and listen to God. See someone who is naked, who needs feeding, who is hiding, and listen to God. Moved by the Spirit after you have Salah listened to God. Salah puts us in the right frame that we listen to God first mm. and then commune with God. Oh, don't be so anxious like myself have been at so many times, I just got to go and tell. I just got to go and tell Jesus all about it. After going through a tough day, after having been in failed situations, after making mistakes, I want to hurry up and get on my knees and, and tell God about it. And, and many times I rush to tell him. But as you think about it, God has told us, even before the words are formed on our lips, he knows all about it. Mm -hmm. 139, Psalm 139 tells us that. So we are not going to tell God anything that he does not already know. Hmm? But what we don't know is what we need to know, and we can have better access if we survive, if we pause and calm and think about it. I know we get anxious, I get anxious, I know I want to say something that maybe is going to help, or maybe it's going to be a load off of myself, but Salah teaches us. To pause, to calmly think about it, soak it all in, listen to God, and then he will direct us on how best to pray. I think on this Mount of Transfiguration, we all will ascend to it. We all will see and have seen the glories of God. Some of it is fascinating, some of it is not so fascinating. The death of a loved one is precious in the sight of God. That's what his word tells us. But to us, it's not so fantastic. But if we would just fall, if 
we would set out and listen to God, his words will give us the comfort that we need to look upon death even as God sees death. Amen. To look upon the tough situations in our lives as God sees the tough situations in our lives and then give thanks. Going up to the Mount of Transfiguration and remembering Salah would give us what we need to go through the most trials of our lives, the most difficult times in our lives, the things that go wrong in our lives, Salah would give us a better perspective for those things that we don't understand and perhaps never will understand. Salah will put us at ease and that we will have a comforting assurance that by and by we'll understand that. That there is weeping, yes, weeping will come and weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So I will give us access to a power that passes all our understanding and all of what we are as individuals because we survive. Amen. We hear from God. We hear a word from God. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We hear a word from God. We listen that says, I will never leave you or forsake. We hear a word from God that says, I will dry your tears. We hear a word from God that says, I am the resurrection, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by I am that I am. We hear a word from God, and our hearts are made glad. We are encouraged. We gain the peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> and then our appropriate response, like that of Peter, James, and John, should have been to give thanks for his glory, to be grateful be a witness of his love. To be in joy for his kindness. And to shout hallelujah that Jesus is mine and I am his and he loves me more than I ever will know. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Not life, not death, not angels or principality, not things present, not things far off, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Hmm? Amen. Salah will get us to that. On our mounts of transfiguration, let us salam. Amen? Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Invitations on page 338.